Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Met. We are glad to be with you this morning, whether you're joining us online or in one of our venues that are maintaining social distancing or here in the sanctuary. We welcome you to worship at the Met. Now, I think it's probably helpful to remind ourselves as we enter a time of, of worship with one another that worship is not something that we do in order to, to earn God's love, but it is something that we do in light of his love for us. We're going to spend time this morning doing actions. We're going we're gonna to hear preaching. We're going to sing songs of praise together, but none of those are actions that earn the Lord's love for us, but they're all meant to be in response for, to what he has already done. And so I would love if we could spend our first moments together standing for a psalm that reminds us of, of who God is and, and what it is that he has done. This is Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just, and all of his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Let's pray together. Father, as we spend time this morning together, hearing from your word, would you, by your spirit, remind our hearts of all that you have done and do and who that reveals you to be. Would you fill us with your truth, not that we might have knowledge of, of concepts and principles, but that we might know the living God, that we might trust you, we might love you, we might serve you. It's in Jesus' name we are able to pray all these things, and we do so. Amen. Sing together, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, and oh my soul, I worship your holy name. Sing it again. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, and oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, and oh my soul, I worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. 
10,000 reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and oh my soul, worship his holy name. I sing like never before, and oh my soul, I worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. For 10,000 years and then forever. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and oh my soul, worship his holy name. I sing like never before, and oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Let's sing, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. And oh, my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. And oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. I will worship your holy name. Lord. Your holy name. I stand amazed. And I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me. A sinner condemned unclean singing how marvelous Ransomed in glory, he 
his face I at last shall see it will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me yeah. singing how marvelous and how wonderful and my song shall ever be and how marvelous and how wonderful is my Savior's love. Let's sing it again. Let's sing it how marvelous and how wonderful and my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous and how I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. ground 
All of the ground is sinking sand. Please take your seats. Well, we want to take a couple of minutes and celebrate some of the many ministry ongoings here at the Met. The first of which, this past week, 66 kids spent their entire March break week here at the Met at our March break camp. It was gadgets and gizmos themed, and they learned that they were, and they are, wired to, to glorify God and to be a light in his world. It was, a, it was a pretty amazing week of ministry. It was fun to be down the hall and hear all the kiddos filling the building every day. And we want to, one, thank the, the many volunteers. We had 20 plus volunteers who spent their entire March break camps serving in this way, and that really is a gift to this church and to the children of this church, but also, uh, two, to some of the parents in here. If you're thinking, I'd really love for my kid to partake in something like that, conveniently, tomorrow registration opens for summer break camps, so you can find information and registration for that online. Second is, is Saturday before last, uh, 50 something men went out and ventured into the snow and, and did our, our Met men's hike together. And it really was a gift. It was a sweet time of, of enjoying God's creation. It was freshly fallen snow from the night before and, and community as well, walking two by two on the path, getting to know one another. If you are a man who recognizes your need for community, we start a, a weekly men's ministry next week, and we would love for you to register for that. It's called Met Men's Fellowship, and we would want to invite you to join us there. Um, but there are also some things we'd like to invite you corporately to as a church, the first of which is giving. As we, as we seek to steward all that God has entrusted to us, whether that be time, talents, treasures, our, our finances fall under those umbrellas. And as uh, members and congregants of this church, we just ask that you would Prayerfully consider how you're giving to the Met and your stewardship of what God has given to you. Now for, for those of you, and I, I do know there are some of us because we've mentioned praying for them from, for, from stage pretty consistently over the, over the past few months, is for those of us who are in a season of, of grief, grieving particularly the loss of a loved one, we would want to invite you to something called Grief Share. So it starts next Sunday. March the 27th, and this is a weekly group where we, we invite you to come and, and process this grief in a biblical community so you're not doing it alone. This is one of the, the hardest experiences on this side of eternity is losing a loved one. And so we want to invite you to a, a humble, friendly group who's willing to walk alongside you. There's, there's content and curriculum that will help guide, but there's people to link arms with as you walk in, in a season of difficulty and strife. Uh, tomorrow, March 21st, marks the beginning of spring, which I, I imagine many of us are, are welcoming here in what I'm learning is a very cold city. Uh, but what that also means is that Easter is right around the corner. And so what we would encourage you to be doing looking toward that, what we would, we would ask the Met to be doing is simply praying. I'm praying sort of twofold. The first of which is that Easter is a is a time still, Christmas and Easter both, when, when people who, who typically aren't a part of the church wouldn't come to church, wouldn't find themselves regularly within a church body for some reason or another, are willing to come. And so we just ask that you would start praying for who you might invite to come with you. Colleagues, parents, brothers, sisters, family members in town, friends in your community. Who, who do you know that doesn't know the Lord, that doesn't uh, haven't, haven't placed their faith in him, haven't experienced the good news of his gospel, start praying now about who you might invite to bring with you. And then second, be praying that as the gospel is proclaimed, that it might fall on soil that receives it. We know that we can't wake our hearts up on our own. Ephesians 2 makes clear that we were dead in sin and dead people don't make themselves alive. They need external help and that comes by the work of the Holy Spirit. And so we ask that you would be praying as we look towards Easter, a, a tremendous evangelistic opportunity, that you would be praying that the Lord would bring sons and daughters home by trusting in his son who came for us. 
Let's also make sure to be praying for our missionaries of the week, Lucia Eberly, who serves with Dorca's Widows Project in West Africa. They, they cherish our prayers at this time, and so let's turn to the Father in prayer together. Father, we thank you first and foremost for sending your Son, that he came and revealed who you are, and in his humble sacrificial life and death and resurrection that he reconciled us to you. We thank you for the grace that we get to walk in, extended to us through him as we find ourselves day in and day out falling short in sin and that there are new mercies for them every morning. We thank you for for ministry opportunities here at the Met like March March Break Camp, God. Would you use our, our humble efforts to build children on the solid rock of Jesus Christ? We ask, Lord, that you would bless specifically the, the Dorcas Widow Project in West Africa, specifically Lucia and, and Sula, her mother, who also serves there. We thank you for their ministry obedience, serving those who are marginalized and forgotten, and we ask that you would bring redemption through their efforts, identifying and equipping the local leaders that they need from amongst the widows to continue advancing your kingdom. We pray for those experiencing grief in this moment, Lord. Whether their wound is new and fresh or old and deep, there are plenty of us in the room suffering from the heartache of loss. And I thank you, Lord, for promising to comfort the brokenhearted and praise you for your means of doing so through the gift of one another. Would you use a ministry like Grief Share to bring lonely grievers into burden-bearing community that you might bring healing? We ask, Lord, too, as we, as we set our eyes on the Easter season here at the Met, that as we celebrate Jesus' atoning death and resurrection, that you would bring faith to all who might hear the good news. You know what you intend to do through this, but we do not, and so we entrust it to you. We also, Lord, gosh, we, we, we pray for those around the world, in particular those who need your comfort, provision, and care in, in Ukraine. Remind them of your presence. Disrupt and destroy the, the attempt of, of evil deeds going on and bring justice to the glory of your name. Finally, Lord, as we spend the rest of our time together this morning, would you nourish us with your word, enlighten the eyes of our hearts to who you are, and move us to respond in worship and praise and gratitude and joy by the work of Jesus. It's in his name we pray all these things. Amen. One of the things that we cherish and love the most as Christians and as, as what was represented here at Matt Bible Church is the gospel. But sometimes I think we forget what the gospel is. It, it becomes distant. Or we're like, what is it really about? You know, simply put, that we are people who are, are separated from God, never to be right with him on our own. But then what does God do out of his great love for us? He sends his own son, Jesus, to die. He comes to live a perfect life first a perfect life that we could never live, to die, to take on him the weight of all of our sin, the full wrath of God that we deserve on himself, and to be judged. And then three days later, he's raised from the dead so that we can be right with God. Our sins can be forgiven. And one day, we can also live with the hope of heaven. But I think if we're honest, I know that the gospel, this good news, can become really almost too familiar where it loses its goodness after, after a while. Which is why at this church, one of the things we try to prioritize is singing songs that are gospel-centered, that remind us of these truths. So today the song I'm gonna, Liz is gonna sing, and I want you just to be able to sit and take it in. Um, it's a song that says, See How He Loves Us. And I think, you know, in a world where things are broken and people are hurting, one of the things that we all need to hear is how much we're loved. To be reminded, ultimately, that God loves us. So this song will, again, clearly explain and articulate this gospel. And then I want this song just to be able to, almost like a balm on your hearts and to remind you how much he really does love you. So we're going to play it, and uh, feel free to sing along if you'd like to do that.
Well, let me pray before we begin. Um, God, it's, it's truly wonderful to think about the love that you have displayed for us in your Son. It's truly marvelous. We're thankful. And I pray that as we look into your word now, that we would even be more astounded by the depths of your love. And that would move us to a life of worship in everything that we are. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it's always a privilege to be here with you. If you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, you can open to Matthew chapter 6, or you can use a pew Bible if you'd like. 
I'm going to be looking at verses 5 to 14. Uh, as you turn there, and as you kind of uh, get ready for it, I have a question. Uh, you don't have to stand up and answer, by the way. Uh, it's just to think about it a little bit. Uh, and here's the question. If, if I asked you, if anybody asked you, why do you pray? What would you say? Now, I'm assuming something here, right, that we, we do pray, which I think is true. Uh, we're not talking about the content or the frequency or the, you know, the length of our prayers. Uh, you guys pray, right? Yeah? Okay, that's good. <laughs> Why? Why do you pray? And there are many answers that we can give. Uh, we can talk about, you know, how this builds our relationship with God. We can talk about how we need wisdom for life. We need wisdom for living. We can talk about the hope that that brings into our lives. We can talk about uh, that we pray because Ottawa senators are horrible and they need a miracle. We can talk about how we pray because we need strength for every day of our lives. We can talk about so many things, but we cannot miss one specific point, the sole fundamental reason for our prayers, and that is worship. And that is worship. Worship as a seeing and seeking the greatness of God in everything that we are about. And so then putting that into our prayers, allowing them to lead us into a life that desires that, desires to see God high and lifted up. One of the responsibilities, actually the most important responsibility we have in our lives is to be in everything to the praise of His glory, as Ephesians would put it. Or as, you know, in the first Corinthians it says, whatever you do, whatever you drink or eat, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. God made us for himself to reveal who he is. He made us in his image so that we would walk and in this world show to all creation, to one another, to people who don't know him, would show that God is great. That is the reason for our existence. And so it follows that prayer, which is one of the most conscious aspects of our relationship with God, should be really driven by the desire to worship God as well. Why do we pray? Listen to Isaiah for a moment. In chapter 59, in verse 1, the prophet says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, or his ear dull, that it cannot hear. You know, he tells them God is able to do more than what you seek for, more than what you ask for, and God sees and hears and cares. But, verse 2, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. And what follows is a lengthy list of ways in which people who prayed, who were seeking God and were wanting for some answers, could not see him answer, could not see him come through. And so he says, you know, verse 3, their hands are defiled with blood, their tongues are speaking lies in verse 4, verse 6, they do violence to one another, verse 7, their feet are running to evil, and it continues in this cheerful manner all the way to verse 13 when he kind of sums it up and says, you are denying the Lord and turning away from following our God. In other words, fundamentally, the people who call God Father are living in ways that defy Him and are asking for things that do not bring the honor of God. Oh, they're praying. They're praying but God's glory does not drive their prayers as it does not drive their lives. Why do you pray? Why do we pray? What do we seek? In Malachi chapter 1, the last Old Testament book, God comes with questions to people who claim to belong to him and says in verse 6, A son honors his father and a servant his master. And then comes a pointed question. If then I am a father... Like, if you call God Father, he says, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts. And then in verse 9, he says, and then you come and entreat of me, favor of me for yourselves, not for the greatness of my name. 
and a staggering pronouncement comes in verse 10. All of that there were one among you who would shut the doors to my temple that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. Why? Verse 11. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name or to magnify my name, but it is not so among you. God tells them outright, like, just stop with the incense. Stop with the prayers. They mean nothing. They mean nothing. They're not about the glory of who I am. Shut the doors. Don't even come. You're missing the point. And you know, like, uh, we have to ask ourselves, are we? Are we missing a point in our prayers or that point in our prayers? Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 6 are of utmost importance to us. They are echoed in every godly prayer prayer that happens in the New Testament. Uh, They are the heartbeat of every acceptable prayer that has already been spoken in the Old Testament. And they guide us into this indispensable foundation for the worship of God. If you follow with me, verses 5 to 14. And when you pray, that's Jesus teaching his disciples, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, verse 7, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now there's much going on here. In verses 5 to 6, Jesus challenges the motivation of our prayers. Are they seeking God's presence or are they seeking something for ourselves, self-advancement? And then in verses 7 and 8, he challenges the attitude of our prayers. Are they spoken in the humble submission to God or they seek to manipulate Him? And then in verses uh, 9 to 13, He gives us a structure to model our prayers after. And all of that, all that teaching is governed by one verse, which is the heartbeat of prayer, which frames the challenges and informs the structure. And it's verse 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. These are the very first words that Jesus teaches his disciples, teaches all who would call on him and through him to come to the Father to pray, to begin their prayers with, to shape their prayers after. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. They give us foundation for all our coming before God. This is the why that sets the fear of verses 5 and 6, the fear of God before us, over and against the importance of self, of the fear or the fear of man. This is the why of verses 7 and 8 that humbles us before God. This is the why of the petitions that Jesus leads us through in the rest of his teaching. And it's all about seeing the glory of who God is which draws us to come in prayer to Him, and then seeking that glory in all my coming before Him. Seeing that leads to seeking. Our Father in heaven, that's seeing. God-honoring prayer sees His glory. This is the basis of who He is, the basis of our coming before Him, that He is this glorious Father. The more we see His glory, the perfection for you is, the more we are drawn to spend time in His presence. Our Father in heaven. Our speaks to all who put their hope in Christ, and in this way I brought into the presence of the Father. Father speaks to the basis of that hope. In heaven speaks of this indestructible, incorruptible nature of that hope. 
And they together zero us in on the glory of God, revealed in creation, spoken in the prophets, but most visibly and splendidly manifested in the coming life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Jesus is teaching those words to disciples, the cross is still ahead of him. Nevertheless, that is the foundation of his words, because it is only through what he was about to do, and now as we look back at what he did, it is only through his sin-forgiving, life-giving death on the cross and resurrection that we are welcomed to be the children of God. They were invited to come in his presence, only as we believe in his name, that he's true to his character, true to his promises that he indeed died for my sin and rose for my justification. It's only because of that that we can actually call God our Father. Jesus, in teaching his disciples to pray like this, points them and points us to the cross. Not everyone is a child of God. Not everyone can truly call God their Father. Like right now, right here, not everyone can come before God and claim Him as Father. You know, there's this idea in the world that we're all children of God. After all, God created everything, sustains everything, right? He loves the little children. I love to sing this song to my sons. Two of them kind of groan this out. I still sneak it in, you know, that 17-year-old laying in bed and just sneak it on him. It's such a precious moment because I want them to know that God desires them. And I know the song talks about Jesus loving little children, but it points to this reality that through Jesus we come to share in the fatherhood of God. I want them to know that. I want them to rest in that. But in the end, I'm so well aware that even though the world thinks that everybody's a child of God, not everyone is. Because it is not some kind of inadvertent thing that happens that just because we're born into this world that we become children of God. It is a very intentional thing. Those who believed in his name, John says in chapter 1, to them God gave the privilege to be called children of God. And here in this prayer and pretty much everywhere else in the Bible where the Bible speaks about this familial bond of God, it speaks about this intentional relationship. In Matthew 6, all throughout the chapter where this prayer is located, Jesus speaks of the care, the provision. He talks about how God is there for his children. In verse 26 of chapter 6, he talks about the sparrows, right? Remember, like, God cares for the sparrows. Not even one of them falls to the ground without God knowing them. But then he says, how much more God, your heavenly Father, cares about you. There is the creation. He cares about every little thing about the creation. But how much more he cares about you. Later on, in Matthew chapter 13, it becomes even more pronounced as he makes sure that we understand that not everyone belongs to him. And he speaks about those who are the sons of the evil one and those who are the sons of the kingdom of their father. If God is not your father, the devil is. And then in Matthew 28, after the death, after the resurrection, as he meets the women who have come to seek for him in his tomb, he tells them, tell my brothers, speaking of his disciples, to go to Galilee. I'm going to meet them there. And that is all to speak a very crucial point that our father, our belonging to our father, to God our father, is a matter of redemption. It's a matter of redemption. In other words, creation doesn't make us the children of God. It's redemption. And through redemption, as we put our hope and our trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, we are amazingly welcomed into the family of God. Amazingly, because we have done everything to be excluded. You know what I mean? We've done everything to be shut out, but Jesus absorbs the wrath due to our sin and makes us his children. And astoundingly, as you go through the scripture, we become with Christ co-heirs of the Father's kingdom, co-rulers with Christ over the Father's creation, and even co-judges of the angels who do the Father's bidding. 
That's incredible. And that's all through redemption, where we bend our knee under the reality of our enmity with God and realize that there's nothing we can do to commend ourselves to Him. We turn to Christ, crucified, risen, who through that buys us back, redeems us, covers for our sin, and gives us the privilege to be called children of God. Desperately, desperately trusting Jesus to absorb the wrath due to our sin. Listen, don't miss this. Don't miss this for coming to church all these years. Don't miss this for being a part of a Christian community all these years. Don't miss this for being brought up in a Christian home. Don't miss this. You cannot claim our Father unless Christ has become your Lord and Savior. Not some religious sprinkling on your life. Lord and Savior. And when He has, and when He has, we share with Him in the Father. And that is incredible because this hour of the prayer, yes, it speaks to, to, to this, to us, right? Different contexts, different cultures. It's like I love the Met for its diversity and ethnicity. We have, you know, Americans, yeah, Canadians, right? We have people from Haiti, we have people from Poland, from everywhere in this world. Every tongue and every nation will come and bow before the Father and call Him our Father. But incredibly, we also come to share with Christ in His Father, in His uh, share. Well, how to put it? In a, we share with Christ in His privilege on his joy of having God for the Father. Like, like Jesus, it's incredible. Jesus calls us brothers. Jesus affirms that his Father is our Father. Jesus in John 17 tells us, and he prays for us to his Father, that he would love us, the Father would love us the same way he loves him. It's astounding. It's astounding. What a privilege our Father in heaven we share with one another, but we share with Christ in having God for our Father. You see, we need to see the marvelous display of God's glory in this. God, perfect in all that He is. Creator and Lord of everything that there is. Giver and sustainer of life. Holy, majestic, Sublime sent his son, the second person of the Trinity, who humbled himself to the point of death to make those who defied him his children. Think about the glory displayed in those words. Our Father, who does that? Who of the world's greats? desires to give a life for those who burn with hatred against them. Maybe for a good person, one would dare to die, but God dies for sinners. Those who defy Him, those who scorn Him, those who disparage Him, those who with their lives, if not with their words, say away with Him, crucified Him. God dies for sinners to rescue them from the just wrath that is coming against them and to make them children. Our Father. Like, do you see the glory of God in those words? Do you see the greatness of who He is? God bids us come. This is what draws us near and tells us to rest in His presence. God honoring prayer sees His glory. In fact, it is rooted in that glory. It is shaped by that glory. A while ago when I was in school in the States, a friend of mine invited me to an NBA game. Uh, somehow we got great seats. I don't know how he did it, but what was... The best part, was supposed to be the best part of this game, is that after that, we got an invitation to meet Larry Bird. You guys know who Larry Bird is? Yeah? Some of you don't. You know guys know Michael Jordan? Anybody? Mind? Well, Larry Bird was better than Jordan. <laughs> he wasn't, but he was taller. Um, so 
anyways, it was exciting, right? It's like it's a one in a lifetime opportunity. And we get tickled by that. We get tickled to you know meet somebody famous, to meet somebody who is like you know somebody in the world and everything like that. But it, I mean, if you were never in a position like that, it's all hype, little substance. Okay, like it was so underwhelming. The guy didn't even shake my hand. It was nice to get an invitation, but like you could tell that he doesn't care about you. You could just tell that. Here. Here is an invitation to meet true greatness. True greatness that desires you. That astounds me because who are we? True greatness that desires for you to have fullness of life. This is an invitation to come and rest with him, to know him. This is an invitation to worship, isn't it? To come and linger and listen carefully what our Father means. To consider the fatherly desire for the goodness of my life. Who gave us his Son and with him gives us all things. To come and find refuge in the nearness of the Father who never leaves us, who never forsakes us. To find rest in the might of the Father whose arm is not too short to save. To come and take heart in the discipline of the Father who loves those he disciplines and disciplines because he loves to be embraced by the graciousness of the Father because there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, to be strengthened in the hope of having God as our Father in heaven, whom no one can challenge, whose word always stands, and who speaks goodness over us. Do you see the glory of God? Worship seeing perfections of who he is as our father, the incorruptible nature of his love and resolve as the one who is in heaven, meaning his word always stands. He wins. He's for us. His promises never fail, and his will is done. The sovereign one. The more we see it, the more we draw near. Do you see it? our Father in heaven. And what happens to our prayers as our life is taken up with the vision of the glory of God is that we begin to seek that glory in our lives as well. Seeing leads to seeking. Hallowed be your name. That's seeking. God honoring prayer seeks his glory. Just as his glory is the foundation on which we stand and by which we are drawn to pray, it is also to be the reason, the ultimate goal for all our prayers. Our prayers need to express this desire for an ever-growing manifestation of the greatness of who he is. Hallowed be your name. The prayer that Jesus teaches, if you kind of look at the structure of it, is structured around six petitions. Uh, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Uh, and that's all. The first three are focused on worshiping God or adoration, right, in humble submission. And then the next three, uh, that's the daily bread, the forgiveness and deliverance from evil. And those look still in submission to God in, uh, for provision for our lives in different ways. So that's the immediately kind of apparent structure of the teaching. But there is an essential priority and inclusion of the first petition, the hallowed be your name, in every single one of them, in all the other ones. It governs them all. Here's what I mean. The phrase, hallowed be your name, is a fervent request to God, for God, to be magnified in all that I am. This is the focus on verse 9, but this is also the ultimate goal of all the other petitions. In asking for his kingdom to come, ultimately, we are asking for his glory to fill the earth. In asking for his will to be done, ultimately we are asking for all people, all nations, to bow humbly before his majesty. In asking for our daily bread, ultimately we are asking for the display of his glorious faithfulness to sustain us so that we have strength and breath and everything to live to the praise of his glory all of our lives. In asking for forgiveness of our sins, 
Ultimately, we're asking for the affirmation of His gracious, glorious mercy towards us so that with a clean conscience, we would walk to the praise of His glory. In asking for deliverance from the temptations of the evil one, ultimately, we are asking for the display of His glorious sovereignty, of His might, of His care to keep us pure as we proclaim His excellencies. All the petition. All the petitions, all our prayers, their goal is none other than worship, than the hallowing of the Father's name. And that's why I say that the God-honoring prayer seeks His glory, because it has to be. Isn't that our desire as Christians? To live in such a way that in everything, in every little thing, and in every big thing, God will be magnified in our lives. Isn't it? And so that's why all our prayers should ultimately seek that. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't ask for our daily needs. We don't bring our heartaches or stop confining in Him. No, we do. We have to. We need to. In this, we affirm His faithfulness. In this, we affirm our faith in Him. In this, we affirm His care and wisdom. We affirm that He's glorious in the way He governs over our lives. What we cannot do is to come to Him as means to our own ends. Where we treasure something else instead of treasuring Him and try to use Him for our own ends. Where we pray as those who have set something else than Him as the treasure of our lives. Now that's tricky, right? Because like, how do you pray then? How do you ask? What Jesus is leading us to here is a place where the heartbeat of our life is worship. And that prayers express that. Where our prayers show that we desire to live for His honor. And that might sound a little bit abstract, but it's super concrete. Uh, This expression, hallowed be your name, has a definite meaning and affects everything. Uh, I mean, we don't use it very often, right? We don't tell our kids, you know. I hope you're going to hallow God's name. It's cool, right? Like, it's not the part of our language. Unless KGV is your translation or New King James, then it's all over the pages. No. If somebody asks you what you do on Sunday, I doubt you're going to say, I'm going to go with church to hallow God's name. Thou willest to come with us, right? We don't speak like that. But I think we kind of understand that it's about worship. It's about sanctification, all this kind of stuff. But then in the Bible, this phrase is defined for us. God gives us a view of what it actually means. In the Old Testament, there are several places where that meaning comes to light. For instance, in Leviticus 22, and it's placed in the context of commandments regarding how the priests are supposed to come and worship God with their offerings. And it says in verse 31 of chapter 22, So you shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. And then verse 32 And you shall not profane my holy name that I may be sanctified or that I might be hallowed, as New King James translates it, among the people of Israel. So hallowing, among other things, means obedience. Means hearing what God says and doing it. It's obedience to His word, to the perfections of who He is, trusting Him in that. And then Numbers 20, as Moses is told by God to speak to a rock as he's leading weary and complaining Israelites through the desert, he gets frustrated. You must remember that? And he strikes the rock with a staff twice, I think. And immediately God speaks to him. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in verse 12 of Numbers 20, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy or to hallow me, In the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land I have given to them. So we see the frustration of Moses, but God sees unbelief. He sees lack of trust because to hallow God is to trust Him, no matter the cost. To trust that His word is better than any other word spoken to me, that His way is better than any other way I might walk into is to have faith in Him and to follow Him in that. One more, Isaiah 29. God gives the prophet a vision of transformation that will happen as people come to trust him. And he says, uh, Jacob shall no more be ashamed. No more shall his face grow pale. For when he sees his children, the work of my hands in his midst, they will sanctify my name, hallow my name. They will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob. They will hallow the Holy One of Jacob. They will stand in awe of the God of Israel. 
And this threefold, threefold repetition, restating, is restating this one truth in different ways. Speaking of hallowing as reverence. Speaking of hallowing as awe. Speaking as walking in the fear of God. Fearing God above fearing man. Allowing for Him to be the Lord of my life and giving my life in submission to Him. Obedience, faith, reverence. And then all throughout the Old Testament, this idea of set apart comes through as well in this word. And so our lives become captivated with what God desires for us. May I lie, my life, be given to you in everything. May I seek your wisdom. May I open your word to know what you need for me to do, how you want me to live. May I submit yourself to your teaching in reverence, seeing the greatness of who you are, not fearing the people around me, but fearing you and walking in ways that say that you are great, obeying you. May all my prayers seek that. And if in any prayers I do not seek that, don't answer them. And if I don't pray for what I'm supposed to pray, lead me to pray for what you want me to pray. Because my heart's desire is to worship you. May the majesty of your presence overwhelm me that I'll just see you. And not just do this in me, do this in my family. Do this in my church. Do this in the nation. Have dominion from sea to sea. Father, cause your name to be hallowed. Your name, right? Who you are. What you stand for, your authority, your character, your purposes, your ways, all that you are. May it be seen, sought after, honored. God, honoring prayer, sees God's glory. And that's why we come, because of who he is. That's our invitation. God-honoring prayer seek, no, that's sees and now seeks his glory. <laughs> and that's why we pray. That's our goal. In my life, in my family's life, in my church, in the world. You know, for years I have heard, read, recited this prayer, but I was missing the point altogether. Uh, I grew up in a Catholic family. Goodness, a Catholic country. Uh, and so these words were a mainstay of our common religiosity. I could say them with my eyes closed, which I suppose is how you say it usually. Uh, but you know, it's like a reflex. Like to this day, I can say it in Polish. Like, like Ojcze nasz, który jest w niebie, święci mi twoje, przyjdź królestwo twoje. And just keep it going. Just in my mind, I haven't said it in years. Well, I did this week because I was like, wow, I can't still remember that. But here, here's what the sad thing is. Four years, it had this ring of punishment in my ears. Right? Like a priest would usually prescribe several of those and some other stuff uh, at the end of a confession encounter. And I, would, and I would do it. I would count them off. I would pay for my sins. But these are not punishment. These are not some religious tokens. These words are invitation to delight in the Father. These words are invitation to look at life through the prism of God's glory. These words are an invitation to a life-satisfying submission of who I am for the sake of His glory. When God found me and made me His own, like in so many ways, my past Catholic ways just influenced my life. Uh, one of them was a distrust, just distrust, deep distrust to various aspects of faith that even remotely pointed back to my past life. And the Lord's Prayer was one of them. Uh, and I just neglected it because it reminded me of the shadow of days past to my detriment. It was only in the last 10 years that God, by His mercy, began to bring this back into my life. Now, here's why I opened my life a little bit before you. Because... I look at evangelical Christianity and I look at this prayer and it's nowhere to be seen. What happened? I mean, Jesus teaches this us for a reason. I'm not advocating that we thoughtlessly enter into repetitions, but to dwell on these words 
And just turn them over in your mind to see the heart of Christ, the heart of God behind them. To talk about them with our family at the dinner table. To proclaim them together as a church. To use them for guiding our encounters with God. To follow their lead towards the glory of God. Listen, this is to step into prayers that truly honor God and align us with His purposes. These words that Jesus taught His disciples to model their prayers after, they don't simply shape our words. They shape our hearts. They lead us to worship. So here's what I want to leave you with. Do you see the glory of God? Is He your Father? Do you seek the glory of God? Is He your treasure? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Like may these words lead us to repentance and fill us with all-pervading passion for the seeing and seeking of the glory of our Father in our prayers and in all our lives. Would you bow with me? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, yours truly is the kingdom. Yours truly is the glory. Yours truly is the power. Now and forever, for all eternity. And so may we live in ways that make much of you in all that we are. We come because your son has given us the privilege to be called your children. Amen. stand with us and let's let's sing to that end as we close
Good rival. Galatians 3, 26, short verse, simple verse, profound verse that, that Greg alluded to. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. And so by Jesus' work, by who he is in his name, and as we trust and believe in him, we become sons and daughters, which empowers us to go this week praying and living that we might see his glory, that we might seek his glory. If you are new to the Met. We welcome you. We're glad you are here. We would love to connect with you. There's a glassed-in room outside the sanctuary doors to your left called The Hub, and there's a, a handful of people in there who would love to get to know you and help you get connected. If in light of this morning's message or in circumstances in your life, you're in need of prayer or a conversation with someone on our ministry team, we'll have representatives from our team in each of our venues, and those of you online are welcome to reach out to us as well. I would love to, to conclude our time together with a, a quick word of prayer if we could. Father, we do thank you for sending your son that we might be adopted as sons and daughters. And as we depart from this room, we, we put our hope in you. I pray, Spirit, that you would help us and guide us that as we pray and as we live, that we would see your glory, that it would be the driving force behind all that we do, and that we would seek it as well, that what we would receive and enjoy by the work of your Son, we might make known to others that you might be glorified by it. Help us to taste and enjoy the faithfulness and redemption only available to us in Christ. It's in his name that we pray these things and that we go this week. Amen. Be blessed.